creative work online has been broadly labeled content. 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 Content is a state of mind. I think the widespread embrace of the word content actually means something. And it's not great. This episode is brought to you by Nebula, where right now you can watch an exclusive bonus video I made in which I rank every hairstyle Tom Cruise has had in all of his movies. You may have thought that was just a joke in the last episode, but no, it's real. I made it, and it's out now. The world has changed. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. Something is coming. A humble man, yet filled with a godlike rage that can only be slaked on the field of online film commentary. Emma. It's time. You don't mean. That's right. It's happening. Alert the masses. The Horn of Vulcan. Must be the content episode. Hello and welcome to today's episode. Heads up, this one is going to be a little different than usual. I mean, so was last episode about AI filmmaking, but this time we are taking that baton and running farther into uncharted territory. See, this is a video that I have been threatening to make for years. A topic that I have been stewing over for a very long time, and finally, the time has come. Over the past 15 years or so, a new word has become a part of our vocabulary. Well, it's technically a word that already existed, but it has found a new meaning. As the internet, particularly YouTube, has allowed people to make careers by independently producing and releasing creative work online, that work has been broadly labeled content talking about making content. Create more content. Consistently post content. That quality content. Snippet worthy content. Your content. 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 And more recently, the definition of the word has expanded. Now, content doesn't just apply to internet media made by independent creators. Now, it applies to traditional media like movies and TV as well. Our great content is what drives our numbers. Even more content. More original content. Great content. Increasing the amount of content. Content for kids. Content for families. Nonfiction content. Bouquet of content. Array of content. Anyone who's ever met me in person or follows me on Twitter knows that I am not a huge fan of this word. And I realize that this might sound sort of crazy. After all, Aren't I a content creator? Don't I literally make content for a living? What the hell am I talking about? This is all true. I do technically make content, which does technically make me a content creator. But I don't like saying that. I have spent years complaining about this to friends who mostly don't care. 
While stuck on that island, I tried to write a whole book on the subject, except I was writing it in the sand, and then the tide came in and washed it all away. And other Patrick, for all his many flaws, felt the same way, and even had this important line in his theme song. So yeah, we are here today to talk about a word. I am fully aware that this is a stupid problem. It doesn't really matter. Why am I making such a big deal about it? Well, when it comes to content, it's not like I just hate the sound of the word. I'm not nitpicking and claiming it's grammatically incorrect. My issue is with what I think it represents. I think content is a state of mind that can have a much larger cultural effect than you might expect. And when it comes to art and cinema and the industries around them, I think the widespread embrace of the word content actually means something. This word comes preloaded with a bunch of implications that we're going to get into, but the reason I want to talk about this right now is that my underlying concerns with content, or rather the meaning behind it, are kind of being shared by Hollywood at this very moment. As we speak, the Writers and Actors Guilds of America are both on strike, something that hasn't happened since 1960. That's close to 200,000 people who agree with me. Sort of. Obviously, they're not striking over the word content the way I've threatened to numerous times. Please don't fire me, Dave. But they're fighting for better treatment under a system that increasingly devalues creative work. Now, you may be wondering, am I taking advantage of an historic labor strike to make a petty point about a pet peeve of mine? <laughs> Only a little. But if you'll give me the chance, I'd like to explain why I think a particular mindset has been so toxic for creativity over the last few years, and why these ongoing strikes are a necessary turning point in the content era. And once this episode is done, I can hopefully stop going to parties and killing the vibe by yelling about a dumb word I hate while everyone slowly backs away from me. Instead, I can move on to more important issues, like figuring out why my audience is 90% male and only 10% female, and why the vastly male majority refuses to watch a video about Taylor Swift. Wow, Patrick, are you telling me most women don't want to watch a 30-something-year-old white man complain about terminology for media on the internet? I know, right? Emma, I am just as shocked as you are. Anyway, here's 5,000 words on why I don't like it when people say a word. So let's take a look at the word itself. Content. C-O-N-T-E-N-T. -E content. In the classic confusing style of the English language, the word content, a noun, is spelled exactly the same as the word content, an adjective, which has a totally different meaning. And speaking of that, if you're thinking of commenting on this video with something like, Hey Patrick, I guess you're not content with content. Just don't do it. I promise you, so many people have made that joke before, it hasn't been funny since 2018, so stop it. But anyway, content, the noun, is generally used to refer to what is inside a container or some larger whole. Like we refer to the stuff in this bag as the contents of the bag. At the beginning of a book, there is a table of contents. Another well-known usage is in the infamous parental advisory labels on music, warning that the album contains explicit content, such as in Tenacious D's self-titled album. Here, the word content is not referring to the work itself. It's not saying the album is content, it's saying that within the larger whole, there is content inside the album, and some of it is, apparently, explicit, such as the track on Tenacious D called Hard Fucking. Content is commonly used in discussions of art and literature in the context of form versus content. 
When discussing a piece of art, the content refers to what the piece is, like the subject being presented, and the form is how it is presented, the specific process and techniques. But let's put all that aside, because our discussion for today really starts in 1964, with Marshall McLuhan's book, Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man, specifically the first chapter, the medium is the message, which became so well known that three years later, McLuhan expanded that chapter into its own book. The chapter is primarily about the ways that electronic mediums like television, cinema, and radio have impacted the way art and information are created and processed. It gets a little bit dense, but here's the part that is important for our conversation. McLuhan refers to a medium, such as television, as an environment or a container, and inside of that medium is what he refers to as content. He writes that, The content of any medium is always another medium. The content of writing is speech, just as the written word is the content of print, and print is the content of the telegraph. He puts this in a very clinical way, and for most of the next few decades, barely anyone else outside of academia or media analysis was using the word content this way. But here, McLuhan establishes a concept that we're going to be using going forward. That of the medium and the content contained within. So now it's time to get radical as we skip ahead to the mid-90s. Internet usage was growing rapidly, and surfing the World Wide Web was starting to become a part of many people's daily lives. In 1996, Bill Gates, yes, that Bill Gates, wrote an infamous essay entitled, Content is King. Here's the opening line. Content is where I expect much of the real money will be made on the internet. Gates goes on to write about how, as the internet grows and becomes more widely used, a new marketplace will appear, where both individuals and corporations will be able to make money by producing content for the internet. Using McLuhan's definitions, here the internet is the medium, and the content is the stuff on the internet, which is kind of broad. In the essay, Gates himself admits this. He writes, the definition of content becomes very wide. For example, computer software is a form of content. News also qualifies as content. So do, as Gates puts it, games, entertainment, sports programming, directories, classified advertising, and online communities devoted to major interests. So literally everything on the internet is content. Not just creative work, every single thing that takes up space there. Gates makes references to the idea that original content will be created by both individuals and companies. And one day, people will actually pay money for it, including paying for subscriptions to content providers. But let's skip ahead here. Nearly a decade later, in 2004, the Pew Internet and American Life Project reinforced Gates' ideas when they wrote, Content creation in our definition includes creating a website, posting material to another website for work, family, or another organization, posting materials to a personal or another person's web blog or online diary, it also includes posting photos, artwork, writing, or audio and video files to the World Wide Web, to a chat room or discussion or news group. So basically, everyone with a blog or a MySpace account, you're technically a content creator. While the internet did become a platform where people would publish and distribute art and creative work, that's not the purpose it was designed for. The important thing to remember here is that the internet was built and shaped by tech people and business people, and so they were the ones who created the terminology. Bill Gates' essay doesn't mention art a single time. He describes the potential of content entirely in commercial terms. Remember, literally the first line is, Content is where I expect much of the real money will be made on the internet. During these early decades of the internet, the word content was mostly an insider industry term, used by the executives running the companies. What changed things was the platform that you're probably watching this video on right now. Unless you're watching it on Nebula, which 
we love to see. There's no ads there, unlike here, where there's gonna be an ad right now. In 2005, a platform called YouTube came along, built on what has become known as user-generated content. As in, all the content on the site was created and uploaded by unpaid independent individuals. As we all know, YouTube would go on to become the second most visited website in the world, after only Google, which also owns YouTube. As someone who has been uploading videos to the platform for over a decade, I can tell you that YouTube's messaging has always been friendly and supportive. And in their friendly, laid-back messaging, they took the term content out of the boardroom and brought it into popular use. While YouTube is a platform based around a single medium, video, over time, it started replacing the word video with content. Your main content is original. What type of content you create. Making great content. They're time watching your content. When the content goes live. We're gonna be talking about branded content. The content you're creating. They told us we're not video creators. We're content creators. We're not making videos. We're making content. Three years ago, in YouTube's studio page, where you can see your channel's analytics and edit your videos, they renamed the Videos tab to Content. And so, the prophecy put forth by Bill Gates in 1996 had come to pass. A new industry of online content creation had risen. From YouTube, there came other platforms where creators could build careers, like Instagram, and new mediums where they could tell stories, new containers for people to fill with content. Before TikTok, you had the web series, Vine, and the college humor sketch. Even Netflix, which is now practically synonymous with television in America, still occupies that weird space between internet and TV. In some parts of the world, like India, a streaming show is still commonly referred to as a web series. And that's where we are today. A new world with new rules that you can arguably trace back to the birth of YouTube, which led to the mainstreaming of content. But there's a lot more going on here than just the words we use. There's the more important matter of what this one word represents. And that is why we need to talk about... Emma, I know I said I wouldn't. Patrick, no. I, I need to do it. Patrick, please. I have to use the P word. Anything but the P word. I'm sorry, but we need to talk about... No! Patrick, please, it's not too late to switch back to something less pretentious, like Tom Cruise's hairstyles or Days of Thunder. Okay, Emma, yes, I hear what you're saying, and a Days of Thunder video would be a lot of fun, but we gotta table that for now, okay? We have content to talk about. Have a little faith in the process. Anyway, over time, as YouTube started phasing out the word videos in place of content, the larger ideas in their messaging also started to shift. They started prioritizing the steady stream of content over individual videos. One video doesn't matter. What matters is the overall accumulation of videos. Their official messaging talks about planning all your future content, looking back on all the content you made last year. Everything is encouraging creators to make more, to post more often. About a decade ago, YouTube shifted its algorithm to prioritize watch time over just views, so creators started making videos longer. The prevailing philosophy is more. This environment is how you get the grind and hustle culture, with people like Gary V constantly screaming at you to be making more content all the time. It doesn't even seem to matter what it is, just post content. No individual piece matters. It's just the overwhelming tidal wave of content you fling at the internet that will make you successful. The number one variable of growing your business in this room is how serious you take making content on the internet. The idea here, with YouTube's autoplay feature, just like Twitter and Facebook's infinite scroll, is to keep users on the platform forever, consuming an endless feed of content. The content doesn't need to make a huge impression, we just need to keep passively consuming it. Have you ever tried to take a moment and reflect on something you've just watched on Netflix, only to have the end credits instantly minimized in favor of some obnoxious ad for what to watch next? 
That's content, baby. So, okay. What is my actual issue here? Like, sure, some of the culture around independently producing work for the internet sucks, but that's not news. But when we return to Bill Gates and his original message that so completely caught on and never went away, content, as a descriptive term, means literally everything, which means it's essentially meaningless. Content is everything on the internet, and so it flattens everything and says it's all the same. It's saying, this philosophy tube video, a deeply personal mixture of essay and performance art, is the same thing as this tweet I posted about buying a new pair of pants. A short film on Vimeo is the same thing as Dwayne Johnson's Instagram reel shilling for ZOA energy drinks. If one thing is content, it all is. This is like saying a novel is the same thing as a phone call. Yes, they are both, on their most basic levels, some form of communication, but they are not the same medium, and we should not treat them the same way. But to the executives, it is all the same. They don't care what the content on their platforms is, so long as people are clicking, and they're running ads on it, and it's generating revenue, and the shareholders are happy. On YouTube, it's us creators who are doing the work, and the people who run the platform are encouraging us to make more and more of it so people will stay on their platform longer. See, the content mindset discourages risk and experimentation. The way platforms like YouTube run is that creators are encouraged to find one thing that works, one formula or type of video, and repeat that over and over again forever. If we experiment and try something different, we're told that our audience will abandon us. It's the same thing with modern studio filmmaking. Once something hits big, executives will try to recreate that thing over and over again, but they won't try to recreate the circumstances that made it unique. Barbie has made over a billion dollars, but the result is less likely to be more independent voices getting to experiment with big IP. It's just going to be more big IP. Hell, Mattel already has an entire cinematic universe of toy-based content in the pipeline, which is such a gross way of saying it, but it's exactly how things are seen from the top down. Last year in a panel at the Cannes Film Festival, Guillermo del Toro addressed this exact topic when he said, There are two pieces of language that enter our lexicon around five, six years ago that are horrible content and pipeline, which are to describe oil, water, or sewage. Whatever it is, they don't describe art and cinema, because they talk about an impermanence, something that we just flush through and has to keep moving. And in my world, a beautiful work of audiovisual storytelling should hold its place next to a novel or a painting. McLuhan said that the medium is the message. And if the medium is the internet, the message I get is that the content there is disposable. It's not real art. On the internet, you're not an artist, you're not a filmmaker, you're a content creator. So let's talk about my work for a second here, because this whole thing is very personal to me. I care a lot about the work I do, and I put, honestly, probably too much effort into it. And every day, YouTube is telling me that I'm making content. The thing is, I really only do one thing professionally. I make videos. So it's a little weird when people talk to me and refer to my content. Like, sure, I post a bunch of stuff online, tweets, Instagram stories, Patreon update posts, but when people talk about my content, they're not referring to any of those. They only mean the videos. So for instance, let's say you hate the content I make. There are several ways you could say that with different terms that are way more accurate than content. You could say, Patrick, your videos suck. Patrick, your show sucks. Patrick, your channel sucks. Patrick, your work sucks. These are all referring to the same thing. So why would you say content? It's too vague. Okay, look, I'm not demanding that anyone call my videos art or that I need a special category or label. And there are plenty of creators who are totally cool with calling their work content, and I'm not going to tell them to stop doing that. Especially when it comes to people who make their living posting daily on platforms like Instagram or TikTok, 
What they make is designed to be consumed in a completely different way than what I make. Six years ago, in a video on the PBS Idea channel, Mike Rugnetta addressed this topic, coming at it from a similar place as me. And he put forth the idea that the content label also has to do with how we experience something. He separates it into consumption versus mere consumption. In other words, yes, we technically are consuming everything, but there's the stuff that we fully focus on and engage with, and then the stuff we look at more passively, like tweets we scroll past or a gaming stream we half watch in the background. So the idea Mike proposes is that maybe the stuff that we merely consume is content. And if we consume it and actually like focus on it, then it's something else. This seems like an acceptable definition to me, but there's one thing Mike says in this video that has totally changed in the six years since he made it. What about Zendaya, Cory Doctorow, or Aziz Ansari? It feels strange to call these people content creators, even though they too have produced many and varied works not easily corralled under one descriptor. Why might calling them content creators feel strange? People don't tend to label American Gods, Dan Brown novels, or the new Perfume Genius record content, but Idea Channel, The Babysitter's Club Club, and Neil Cicerega's work, that there is hashtag internet, hashtag content. Okay, Emma, I gotta get more serious here. Can you desaturate the colors? On it. Perfect, cool. I'm gonna go put on a tie. There we go. In 2013, Netflix, a company whose business had been primarily based around mail-order DVD rentals, started producing their own TV shows, and over the next several years, became one of the biggest studios in Hollywood, competing with the likes of Warner Brothers and Disney. Their new model of streaming movies and TV over the internet revolutionized the industry. Immediately, nearly every studio followed Netflix's lead, launching their own streaming services and also adopting their language. See, Netflix was a tech company, started in Silicon Valley. Co-founder Reed Hastings came from the world of software development, not movie development. So they approached this like YouTube and Bill Gates did before them. To them, a streaming service was just another container on the internet to be filled with content. Netflix almost didn't even get into the TV and film business at all. Co-founder Mark Randolph said that when he and Hastings were starting the company, I really only had a single filter. I wanted it to be selling something on the internet, and I wanted it to involve personalization. Before they settled on DVDs, they considered having the company sell shampoo or dog food. Led by Chief Content Officer Ted Sarandos, Netflix would publicly refer to everything they made, whether a reality dating show or the new Martin Scorsese film, as content. At Netflix, we love to make and show great content. Content that creates customer joy. And the rest of Hollywood followed. So you skip ahead a few years, and now if you watch an interview with Bob Iger or David Zaslav, the heads of Disney and Warner Brothers respectively, it seems like every other word out of their mouths is content. Content. And it's caught on with the public. Online, people are wishing Kevin Smith a happy birthday by unironically telling him he's their favorite content provider. Or you'll see a tweet like this. Which is just insane to me because, like, these are all the same medium. It's not like you have a show and a book and a video game. They're all just TV shows. Why would you call them content and not shows? But again, the problem here isn't just the change in vocabulary. It's the change in ideology. I'll admit that from a business perspective, content works fairly well as a catch-all term for the stuff they're making. Some of it is movies, some of it is TV, but collectively, it's content. It's the stuff that fills the space on their subscription streaming service. But this is also the issue. It's that it boils everything down to entirely business terms. It takes art and makes it a product. There has always been a tension between art and commerce. In the US, Mainstream cinema and TV exist almost entirely within the confines of capitalism. Everything is for profit. 
There are no national funds for filmmakers the way there are in other countries, and the state subsidies mostly benefit major studios. In the US, mainstream art rarely exists without a profit motive to begin with. But the rise of streaming and the idea of content made this more overt than ever. As I mentioned earlier, right now, both the Writers Guild of America and the Screen Actors Guild are on strike. The last time the writers went on strike, in 2007, streaming and digital distribution had just started to emerge, whether it was iTunes or ComedyCentral.com. But the evolving nature of online videos had already become a key issue for some members of the WGA. Here's writer Howard Gould explaining it on the night before the 2007 strike started. I went on NBC.com, clicked on The Office. You can watch entire episodes of 10, 15 series, okay? You click on The Office, what do you get? You get a commercial for Fidelity Investments. Then you watch the cold open, and then you get a commercial for Target. They are monetizing these episodes already. The writers on that show are not getting the typical nice check that you usually get when you're working on a successful series. That goes right to the internet. They're making money on it. We're not making money on those. Those residuals are going to go from what they are towards zero if we don't make a stand now. What Gould is describing is the monetization of online content, something anyone who watches YouTube is more than familiar with. The way traditional TV has always worked is that whenever an episode of TV airs in reruns, the people who worked on that episode get an additional payment, which are called residuals. It's sort of like how I'll get paid a few cents whenever people watch this video on YouTube. But with streaming, there are no more reruns. So no matter how many times people watch those episodes, the writers aren't getting paid after their original flat rate. It's crazy to say this, but as an independent creator on YouTube, I actually have a fairer deal in some ways than professional Hollywood writers. Those residual checks the writers weren't seeing back in 2007 from their shows being aired on network websites, they still aren't seeing them now when they write shows that air on Netflix, and the companies are keeping their streaming data under lock and key so people don't even have an accurate idea of how much money they're missing out on. Their work and their efforts are all just being fed into this big opaque sludge. It used to be that individual movies or TV shows mattered. The studios wanted to generate interest and make sure people cared about a specific movie so people would go to a movie theater and buy a ticket for it. Or later on, go to a video store and spend a few bucks to rent it. Or with TV, people needed to tune in at a certain time on a certain day to watch a specific show. And of course, the more people that watched it, the more the network could charge companies to run commercials during it. But with streaming, the individual movies and shows no longer matter. People aren't paying for them. They're paying for Netflix. All that really matters is the larger entity, the brand. The individual works have been devalued because to Netflix, Disney, or whatever company you're talking about, it's all the same. Now to be clear, the streaming boom has led to the creation of many genuinely great movies and TV shows made by a broader, more diverse collection of artists than ever. But because of the way this media in the content era is handled, movies like Bong Joon-ho's Okja, or Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog, or Steven Soderbergh's Let Them All Talk, they're all just dumped onto a platform, into, as writer Sonia Soraya called it in Vanity Fair, the ocean of content. More than a few times, Netflix has purchased an acclaimed movie at a film festival like Sundance, and then given it an unceremonious streaming release, where it was swallowed up and never talked about again. A few years ago, Lulu Wong, director of The Farewell, talked about how she turned down a huge offer from a streamer to buy the movie because she knew that they wouldn't bother to actually promote it and get people to watch it. It would just disappear into the ocean of content. We got an offer at Sundance from A24 and uh, also got a much larger double offer from a large streaming platform. Mm -hmm. One thing we sometimes don't talk about with some of these bigger streaming platforms is that, you know, it's a different business model. It's not necessarily about making money back. It's about brand. They're building their brand. Mm -hmm. And when you're an established filmmaker, you are a brand that they want to partner with to help build their own brand. But 
with newer filmmakers, newer voices, you don't have a brand. You need to build that brand. And I know now, because our film has been in the theaters for four months, I, I know for a fact that if I took that bigger, you know, the bigger money, that they wouldn't have the energy to put behind someone like me to, to build my brand. But wait, it gets more dystopian. In a recent New Yorker article, Lila Bayok, a writer who worked on Watchmen and The Leftovers, is quoted saying, What the streamers want most right now is second screen content, where you can be on your phone while it's on. As I'm told by my co-writer, Siddhanth, this is something WWE experimented with for a few years before discontinuing in 2015. So to bring back Mike Rugnetta's terminology, this idea of second screen content is mere consumption. The streamers aren't looking for art that doubles as content, they just want content. Patrick, aren't you worried this is getting a little... A little old man yells at Cloud? You know, from The Simpsons? The joke with Grandpa in the newspaper? I don't know what that is, but what I was going to say was, aren't you worried this episode is going to be all, like, crotchety old man yelling about the modern state of cinema? No, I'm not worried. Because there's another crotchety old man who's also concerned about this, and I am happy to be on his side. I'm talking about... Marty. Two years ago, Martin Scorsese addressed this very topic in an essay for Harper's. He wrote, Flash forward to the present day, as the art of cinema is being systematically devalued, sidelined, demeaned, and reduced to its lowest common denominator, content. As recently as 15 years ago, the term content was heard only when people were discussing the cinema on a serious level, and it was contrasted with and measured against form. Then, gradually, it was used more and more by the people who took over media companies, most of whom knew nothing about the history of the art form, or even cared enough to think that they should. Content became a business term for all moving images. A David Lean movie, a cat video, a Super Bowl commercial, a superhero sequel, a series episode. It was linked, of course, not to the theatrical experience, but to home viewing, on the streaming platforms that have come to overtake the movie-going experience, just as Amazon overtook physical stores. On the one hand, this has been good for filmmakers, myself included. On the other hand, it has created a situation in which everything is presented to the viewer on a level playing field, which sounds democratic, but isn't. If further viewing is suggested by algorithms based on what you've already seen, and the suggestions are based only on subject matter or genre, then what does that do to the art of cinema? You know, a lot of people online, especially diehard fans of certain movie franchises, got mad at Marty about this and claimed he was gatekeeping. But he's right. Now, as much as I rail against the word content, obviously, everyone just no longer using that word is not going to solve the problem of creative work on the internet and elsewhere being delegitimized. On one hand, it is sort of nice to have a phrase that groups my work together with the latest film by Noah Baumbach, or the latest Sunday night craze on HBO. Hey, we're all together now, one big content family. But that's not actually how I feel. I would love nothing more than for online work and, I'll say it just this once, content creation to be raised up and taken seriously. But instead, the content mindset just drags traditional media down into a giant ugly pit, and it all becomes this homogenous goop, just waiting to be half-heartedly consumed and discarded. Content is the word of the executives, and if we want to get really extreme about it, it's the language of the oppressor. And I know how hyperbolic that sounds coming from a white dude who isn't actually oppressed, but look at what's happening around us. Artists in Hollywood are fighting for their livelihoods because to the studios, both they and their work are disposable. And if the suits had their way, they would replace their writers' rooms with ChatGPT tomorrow, and their actors with CGI versions of extras they scanned without informed consent, and whose likeness they now own in perpetuity. A real thing, by the way. I guess now, people are content too. Which is... just awesome. Real, really cool. 
See, if everything has the exact same value, which is to say value as a commodity, but no cultural or artistic value, then nothing really has value at all, because you can just throw it away if that happens to be more profitable. Like last year, the $90 million Batgirl movie was cancelled and shelved despite being nearly finished because Warner Brothers Discovery decided they would rather receive a tax write-down than actually release the movie and let people see it. Countless other shows have been taken off streaming services since then, and treated as tax write-offs, with the people who worked on those shows not only being denied residuals, but denied any way to even watch or access the very things they created. Take the Disney sci-fi adventure movie Crater. It cost $50 million to produce, it debuted on Disney Plus earlier this year, and then it was removed just seven weeks later, and isn't available anywhere else. There's no DVD to rent at a video store, it's not in theaters, it might as well no longer exist. Things are pretty dire, and despite the recent success of movies like Barbie and Oppenheimer, it probably won't get better until the studios give in to the union's demands. And hey, Paramount's CEO Bob Backish recently said, we're hopeful that we can solve this as an industry sooner rather than later, because we'd all like to get back in the content production business. But it's not all doom and gloom. I don't know if the strikes will directly benefit me, as a guy who makes videos on YouTube, but I do know that if they succeed, it'll represent a much-needed sea change in how we value art and artists. And things are actually looking pretty strong. On day 95 of the WGA strike, picketers from both unions showed up in droves at Universal. The VFX artists who work for Marvel, some of the most exploited people in the industry, recently voted to unionize. And the pushback is not just limited to the US. Over in South Korea, actors are demanding fairer wages and residuals from Netflix, and are demanding the streaming giant meet with their guild, the Korea Broadcasting Actors Union. Also, back in Hollywood, anybody who steps out of line and even comes close to scabbing is usually taken to task online, so that's one added benefit of today's strike versus 2007. But it also represents a genuine shift in the way labor is viewed and supported, and the way artistic work is seen as something with both intrinsic value and value for the people who created it. The studios and streaming platforms and YouTube may say this stuff is just content, something to be shoved into a large, shapeless sack with a big dollar sign on it, but most people, and certainly most creators, seem to disagree, and they're willing to fight for it. You could say that they're no longer content with content. Hey, Patrick! Yeah? Your art sucks. Thank you. So I know I spent a lot of time here today talking about the problems with YouTube and streaming platforms and how they treat creative work like a bunch of gray slop, so I get how it might seem a little bit silly if I were to turn around and suddenly say, but hey, you should still sign up for my streaming service. And yet, that's, uh, that's actually what I'm doing here. Look, I don't think online video streaming is inherently bad. That would be a crazy opinion. And not every streaming service is bad. Like, you don't see me complaining about the Criterion channel. And one of the ones doing it right, and one that I am really proud to have been involved with since the start, is Nebula our sponsor for this episode. See, most of those problems with YouTube that I complained about earlier, how they devalue individual videos and discourage risk and experimentation, and want us to make an ever-increasing stream of identical content, yeah, that is not what Nebula does. See, the point of Nebula is to encourage creators to take risks and experiment and make those big, ambitious, wild swings that YouTube doesn't like. And they give us funding to do this, to make projects like my feature-length film Night of the Coconut, or Abigail Thorne's The Prince, or Maggie Mae Fish's series Unrated, which explores the history of sex in movies and would absolutely be demonetized on YouTube. 
And instead of dumping these all into an ocean of content, Nebula actually promotes them and spotlights them and helps us make them. Of course, Nebula also has all of our regular videos with no ads, and I am now releasing exclusively on Nebula a bonus companion video for every regular episode. And so, available right now, due to popular demand, after we mentioned it in the last episode as a joke, I have made the video in which I rank Tom Cruise's hair in every movie he's ever appeared in. Clearly, this is the most important work of my career. Look, there are a million cool things about Nebula that I could talk about all day, but I'm gonna wrap things up with this. Right now, if you sign up at the link in the description down there, you can get 40% off of an annual plan, which comes out to only $2.50 per month. And unlike some other streaming platforms, that money actually benefits the creators. Signing up actually supports me. And so, as I have to mention every single time, hopefully this support will eventually be enough where I can buy a real desk and not just a plastic table. Anyway, uh, that's all for Nebula for now and this episode. Thank you for watching. All right, that's a wrap. Man, I wasn't sure I'd be able to fit this all into a single video, but I think I got all that complaining out of my system. Patrick, have you seen this? Is that the research packet for the video? I mean, I skimmed it a little bit, but look at the size of this thing. Who wrote it, Brandon Sanderson? Patrick, this is no time for spot-on literary observations. According to the information in this packet, cinema is dying. Emma, it's not just dying. It's been murdered. The spooky updates come in for the hypnology. Yeah, 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 check out my favorite one. Creaky door witch laugh. <laughs> Look, we have to focus. If cinema's been murdered, who else knows about this? Well, it's all on the internet, so probably a lot of people, but it's been a long day. There's no need to get overly dramatic. Correct, dear Emma. If we want to solve this mystery, we have to let cooler heads prevail. We wouldn't want to get carried away. <coughs> oh shit. <coughs> this sucks.